Psalm 119. Open with a, an illustration, I think, to help us with this concept of Scripture. Uh, many have know of the ship in the 1700s, the ship called, the English ship called the Bounty. And there was a famous uh, movie about it. But it, the Bounty was commanded by Lieutenant William Bly. William ba Bly journeyed to the South Pacific in 1787, and he was going there to the South Pacific to get uh, some specific uh, fruits. It was called, they were going to collect plants uh, of the breadfruit tree. Uh, sailors signed on because they were excited about going to paradise uh, this trip. Uh, Commander Bly, Lieutenant Bly, did not have anybody as far as second in command, so he had a, a good friend. His name was Fletcher Christian. And Fletcher Christian, uh, he assigned him to the post. The bounty uh, then headed out, and they went to Tahiti, and that's where they settled there for about six months. The sailors uh, were led by this Fletcher Christian, and they enjoyed paradise to the full. When time came for de departure, a lot of the sailors did not want to leave. They didn't want to leave paradise, the island. And um, three men... Uh, specifically uh, led uh, a lot of the sailors. They were the ringleaders, and they led a kind of a, um, a mutiny on the island, but they were caught. On the ship, they were flogged, and uh, the mood on the ship changed. And on April 28, 1789, Fletcher Christian staged uh, a famous mutiny, which became a film. And Bly and his supporters were set adrift on an overloaded lifeboat. And believe it or not, in that lifeboat, they made it. They traveled 3,700 miles in a lifeboat and survived. The mutineers aboard the bounty immediately began quarreling about what to do next. Fletcher Christian returned the ship back to Tahiti, where he left some of the mutineers. He kidnapped uh, women. He took slaves, he traveled with the remaining crew a thousand miles to a little island. It was called uh, Pitcairn Island. The little group there, uh, from that point on, it unraveled. They uh, distilled whiskey from a native plant. Drunkenness, fighting marked their colony. Disease and murder, murder eventually took the lives of all the men except for one. His name was Alexander Smith. He found himself to be the only man on the island, now surrounded by an assortment of women and children. But an amazing change occurred. Smith went back to the ship, the Bounty, and started looking aboard the ship, and he found Bounty's neglected Bible. As he read the Bible, he took the message to heart. And then he began instructing this little community that was left from the pages of Scripture. He taught the colonists the scriptures, helped them obey its instructions. And the message of Christ so transformed their lives that um, almost uh, 20 years later, a ship known as the Topaz landed on the island and it found a Christian society. The reading of scriptures and the teaching of scriptures and the transformation that occurred through uh, scriptures take, took a a group of people that were filled with drunkenness and debauchery, and it changed them into a society that was blessed now. They were happy. They were prospering. It was free from crime, disease, murder, and mutiny. Years later, uh, the Bible fell into the hands of uh, a visiting weller who brought it to America, but in 1950, that Bible from the 1780s and 1790s was returned back to that island, and even today you can go to that island, you can see the Bible that transformed that island. In Psalm 119, we're going to read in Psalm 119, we'll read just the uh, first nine verses, and I think most of us know that uh, Psalm 119 it is an unusual chapter, and the reason is it's, it is the longest chapter, there's a lot of stats going along with Psalm 119, but except for basically four verses, 
Every verse of Psalm 119 has something to do about the Word of God. It says in uh, verse 1, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. So law is used. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. That word ways is another word for scripture. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. O oh, forsake me not utterly. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. So here, just in nine verses, you have about five or six different words for the uh, Bible, for the word of God. And so we're going to look this morning at the idea of scriptures. Uh, in your handout, you see that we call this a basic, all right? We have an acronym. In fact, me and another fellow, um, the guy that authors that book, uh, we teach a class uh, almost every Sunday called Growing in Grace. And it's uh, one of our classes that we put together is just the acronym basics, uh, basics. And the S in the word uh, basics is for scripture. And what we're trying to do is help people understand there are basics in the Christian life. And one of the basics for us is the importance of scripture. So your pastor has uh, talked about a bunch of this. So I'm going to skip through some of it uh, because uh, we talked yesterday and he said that he explained some of the doctrine and went into a little bit of detail. And so our first point is what are the scriptures? What are the scriptures? You've already talked about this some. Uh, he went into uh, a little heavier detail on uh, even the, the two family of text. And some people think that the idea of scriptures is not that uh, important. Well, this is, this is why the devil, as I call it, there are a whole bunch of perversions that are out there. Right. Right? The, uh, the reason that the devil doesn't mind so many people, and uh, he talked about this, so many people use the NIV, the ESV is a huge popular uh, version. The NASB, the message. Uh, the reason that the devil doesn't mind people grabbing those is because it doesn't really transform lives that much. It's been, uh, the, the verbiage of the Bible has been ruined. And in fact, in, in uh, one of my classes, when I'm teaching uh, some of our folks about the importance of Scripture, uh, we usually take two or three uh, uh, Sundays and we go through it and one of the exercises we do is uh, we have a, a pretty big library I go up to our library and I bring at least 12 versions of the Bible down and I have them do sword drills and so they'll open uh, I say all right let's turn to this verse they'll open it up and I say all right read it and there's the NIV there's this version and this version and they're looking for it and they can't find it and uh and it's interesting dealing with new believers because uh, I had one new believer. He was almost threw the Bible through the wall. He was so mad. He was like, why are they cutting verses out of the Bible? Because it doesn't make sense. Why would you? Why is it? Uh, who, has, who has the liberty to just go into scriptures and take things out? It either should be there or it shouldn't. But people have decided, well, this is important. Well, some of it comes, and your pastor has talked about this, it comes from families. There's two families, and we call it, uh, there's, a, there's a corrupt line, and there's a preserved line. And the preserved line, this is what's uh, interesting with the preserved line, well over 80% of uh, all this preserved line, 80%, or eight, even over that, 80-something percent, of all the original documents, follow the preserved line. And that's what they don't want you to know. These people from the corrupt line say, oh, well, we have uh, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, if you go into that. And in fact, uh, there's one of the probably the leading experts in the King James is Dr. Uh, Sorensen. And Dr. Sorensen, uh, just he researched it for two years. I have the book sitting in my uh, office uh, at my house. And he wrote a book, Neither Oldest Nor Best, and he believes that the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus are faked. That's, uh, he had researchers over in Europe. 
uh, that studied it, and he believes both of those are faked, and, uh, and it came out. And, and guess when the Vaticanus and Sinaitis became popular is in the 1800s. Well, if you read history in the 1800s, what was sweeping across um, in, in, in the Bible world, what was sweeping across was liberalism um, and uh, basically uh, agnostics and people, uh, higher criticism it was called, uh, out of Germany. And what they were doing is, I believe that the devil was working to bring and uh, tear down the word of God. So what are the scriptures? The word scripture itself means holy writings. I don't know if that's in your handout. I don't have the handout in front of me, but holy writings. I'll take one of them so I can tell you what the blanks are. All right, the word scripture itself means holy writings. And we have uh, names for scriptures, okay? Uh, the word Bible, all right? The word Bible simply comes from the word, it's a Greek word, biblos, B-I-B-L-O-S. All right, biblos, uh, it simply means the book. That's all it means. Uh, in uh, Romans 10, 17, the Bible is called the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. And that's a, a faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so it is important that... Uh, we these names of scripture are important for us and and we just went through psalm 119 and you saw uh basically a half a dozen names right there in psalm 119 uh another word uh let me see philippians 2 16 the word of life philippians 2 16 james 1 18 the bible is known as the word of truth so just in just in three names that the Bible uses for itself, it helps us to understand what the Bible can do. It's the Word of God. If you go to John chapter 1, the Bible, I believe actually in John chapter 1, that Jesus is the living Word, and then we have the written Word. Both of them work together. All right? We have the living Word and the written Word, and both of them working together, what can it do? It says that it's a Word of life, and so... Through the Word of God, there's transforming power. It changes people. That's why uh, a church that goes away from the Word of God, and I believe when they go into using a perversion of the Word of God, they are weakening the transforming power that is available to us for changing lives. We're weakening it. All right, so we have other names for scriptures, and the scriptures, most of us know this, are broken down into two divisions, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay, so we have what is scripture. So then we have, secondly, how did we get scriptures? In 2 Timothy 3.16, first, uh, that's all scripture is given by inspiration, so... Um, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So God gave the words. All scripture, that word um, inspired means God breathed. The word all means that the Old Testament and the New Testament are God breathed. We don't have to worry. Uh, there are some people, in fact, uh, in, in our church uh, right now, I'm studying the book of James. And there are some people uh, that, there are some scholars, in fact, um, Martin Luther, right? Martin Luther, uh, you know, and it's the 500th year, so, you know, a whole bunch of Lutherans, they're all excited, although they really don't believe what he believes. Uh, uh, they've gone way away from it. But uh, Martin Luther, uh, he did not like the book of James. In fact, he did not, uh, he was very close to saying it was not in the canon of Scripture. And part of it is because James, and I think it's just because of a misunderstanding about the book of James. Um, he said he was contradicting uh, Pauline epistles and where Paul said, for by grace are you saved through faith. And what is James says, basically one of his key verses is um, faith without works is dead. And so uh, here was Martin Luther, and what was he fighting? He was fighting Catholicism that basically says you have to work to get saved. 
And he was saying James was agreeing with the Catholics. So James, uh, you, you'd have to study it and read it for a little while. And just a little bit of study through the book of James, you understand that uh, he is not saying that works get you saved. What he was saying is that uh, works accompany salvation. It doesn't get you saved, but a faith that doesn't have works, you better check it out. Amen. That's what he was saying. And so it wasn't, it wasn't that uh, James uh, is not supposed to be in Scripture. And I think that there are, there are folks that look at the Bible and they say, well, what about this and what about this? And all, all they're trying to do is cast doubt on the validity of the Scriptures that we have. But God gave the words. And then God then said he would preserve it for us. So God gave the words. The second thing, men recorded the words. That's found in 2 Peter. If you, I have the verses listed there, but I think sometimes it's good to read them. So 2 Peter chapter 1. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture of a, is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake. And then here's the, another important part. As they were moved by the Holy, the holy Ghost. Okay, so they were moved by the Holy Ghost, so they recorded the words. What kind of men wrote God's words down? They were holy men, holy men. And, and what did they, God gave the exact words, not just the thoughts to men. There is a, uh, and you might have, a pastor may have taught about this, the different types of inspiration. One of them is the idea of thought inspiration. And that there's just thoughts out there. No, that's a dangerous thing to do. God gave the words and he preserved the words for us. And it says it over and over. In fact, all through the Bible, he says that not one word shall fail. All right? His word shall last. His word endureth forever. So the words are important. God gave the exact words. Uh, we have there, uh, each word is pure. Okay, so, uh, so what is pure? Each word, that's in Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. That's why other versions of the Bible uh, cannot be trusted, because they have changed what? His words. And he warns us in Proverbs 36 not to add to them, and in Revelation 22, 19, what does God warn people not to do with his words? Not to add or subtract. And, and Revelation 22, 19, uh, let me read that to, uh, for you. Revelation 22, and if any man shall take away from the words of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That's a, that's a pretty serious uh, punishment for messing with God's words. So God gave the words, men recorded the words, and then the third thing, God preserved the words. You know, some people uh, scoff at the legitimacy of the Bible, and they scoff at uh, how it can change a life. And so uh, there's, there's uh, critics there's guys that say, well, you know, what's the big deal about the words of God? And, I mean, Shakespeare and some of these others, you know, they were, they were inspired too. We are not talking about the same inspiration. Right? right? God breathed. I don't think Shakespeare uh, had his words breathed to him by God. Or uh, Homer, or uh, you can go back to uh, the Greek philosophers. All right, those, that's not the same. But this is what's amazing. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy, in fact, it has become popular in the last year again. There's a man named Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel uh, wrote the book, The Case for Christ, back in the 70s, and it became popular again because I know there's a movie out about The Case for Christ. He was an uh, investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And in the 70s, he, and he was, he was a rising star uh, for the Tribune. He had broken uh, big-time stories. And somebody came to him about God. 
And so what he did is he decided because he was an investigative journalist, he was going to go after God and prove to the world that this was a fraud. So, and that's what the whole book, The Case for Christ, is about. And so what he did is he went and he researched The Case for Christ. Through it, he got saved. Because what he found is the overwhelming evidence was that, no, there, this is unbelievable. There is a case for Christ. And what uh, one of the scholars talked about is just the Gospels. and He was looking specifically at the Gospels, but then he was looking at Scripture. And what he showed was, um, it, it, you know, the, the critics, the critics do not even question a lot of the ancient writings of Aristotle and a bunch of uh, Plato and a bunch of those guys, they don't question at all the things that have been handed down from those guys uh, 2,000 years ago or 2,500 years ago. And he said they only have a couple documents. And they don't even question it. He said for the Word of God, it's well over 5,000 documents. He said, in comparison, you're talking about uh, hundreds of, you know, uh, thousands of documents compared to like five or six. He said, but here are the critics. They don't even question Aristotle or Plato or any of those, and they only have a few documents. But, oh, this is the Bible. He said, doesn't it seem like it's a planned attack? And that's what he, he talked to some scholars, and that's what he, uh, he found out. So there's some people that look at the Bible and they say, oh, you know what, I, I don't know about these words of God. Well, God promised us, and some of it, we have to understand this. We are people of faith. And so by faith, some of it comes down to, I have to trust God when he says in his word that he will preserve it for me. I have to trust him. I have to trust that he's going to bring uh, the word of God and keep it for me. So God gave the words, God recorded the words, and then God preserved the words. God preserved the words. How do we know that we have God's words to us? Well, he promised to protect them. In Psalm 12 and verse uh, 6 and 7, I'll read uh, that passage for you in Psalm Psalm 12, 6 and 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now, in numerology in the Bible, some people can get really uh, bent out of shape with numerology, but the number seven always is a number of perfection. All right, so when it says it's purified seven times, it means that what has come out of this purification process is completely pure. That's what it's saying. It's purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. And then notice it says forever. God preserves the words. So then the third thing we have is why do we need Scripture? Why do we need them? So this is uh, where we get a little more practical, okay? And we'll try to take about 10 or 12, maybe about um, eight minutes, and then we'll, if we have any questions, okay? So we have uh, a decent amount of material on these two, so we'll kind of go through them. I'll list out your blanks there under number three, and then we'll kind of talk about a few of them. So why do we need Scripture? Um, and this may give you further study because we won't be able to go through a lot of them. The Bible is listed as types, and all of these types help us understand what the Scripture can do. So let's go through them. I, I list out a number of them here. First of all, it's a seed. As a seed, it brings life. That's 1 Peter 1, 23. In 2 Peter 3, 15, the blank there, the Scriptures are able to make someone wise unto salvation. And then in Romans 12, 2, it says, as we continue to read the word, and um, that verse, and verse 1, it's telling us to present our bodies in Romans 12, 1. And then in verse 2, 
uh, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. So as we continue to read the word of God, it transforms us and it renews us. So as a seed, it brings life. The second thing, as water, it cleanses. It cleanses. I'll read uh, one of the verses, and that's found in John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, it says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. All right, so as a seed, it brings life. As water, it cleanses. Third, as a lamp, it guides and comforts. All right, and that's, again, the, the, one of the passages listed there is from the Bible passage of Scripture, Psalm 119. Most of us have heard this verse, Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So as a lamp, it guides and comforts. Uh, we, we have a couple of things there. What brings comfort and hope? The scriptures. The scriptures do, according to Romans 15 and verse 4. All right, so as a seed, it brings life. As water, it cleanses. As a lamp, it guides and comforts. As a sword, it pierces. That's Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged. That, that word two-edged, it means uh, two-mouthed in the Greek, two-mouthed. And so what it's indicating to us, you'd say, well, man, that's ir- uh, weird. What, what do you mean by two-mouthed? Well, everything, the idea that everything that is around it, it devours. Okay, everything around it. And you'd say, well, well um, I, I, don't, I don't understand uh, as a, it's a two-edged sword. Well, what that means is as I get into the Word of God, all of the bad things that are there, the closer I am to the Word of God, the more that I study the Word of God, the wrong things, the Bible will devour it and get it out of my system. All right? So it kind of goes along with the cleansing, but as a sword, it pierces. And that's what it says in that verse. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. The, the word of God, that's why some people, I have a, I have a lady, um, and we've been, we've been praying for I believe she's saved. She started coming about two months ago. And uh, her husband is a Muslim. Um, so, she, and so she has a Muslim background, but then she also... Uh, went to Pentecostal churches, and she also went to another one. And so uh, for a while, we were really trying to work with her. She'd come fro- forward. We have a counselor talk to her. And she was just so confused because she had Pentecostal background. She had Muslim background. And uh, she was talking to one lady recently, and she was saying, oh, man, that pastor, every time he speaks, it's right at me. <laughs> well, What's, what it is, it's the Word of God. The Word of God pure sins, to, and, and it, it goes all the way down in. So all of a sudden, we're like, how did he know that? <laughs> What's well, the Word of God? It's the power of the Word of God. The Word of God pierces all the way through because God is a, he's a discerner. That's what it says, discerner of the thoughts, and not just the thoughts, but even the intent. Remember Jesus when he was here on the earth? They, they sometimes, he'd look at the Pharisees and think, hey, you're thinking this. Yeah. Huh? No, who's telling you this? Well, Christ knows the thoughts and intents. Remember, he was the living word. Well, the written word does the same thing for us. All right, so as a sword, it pierces. Uh, the next one, as milk, it strengthens and enables growth. That's found in 1 Peter. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. It says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, and then it says, that ye may grow thereby. So we understand that with a a little tyke, you know, a little baby that's born, and what are they given? They're given milk so that they grow. And the word of God, that's why for a new believer, uh, yes, uh, and we, we have some books back there. 
I, I like books. I mean, I devour books. I love reading. Right? But the, the Word of God is the primary book that we need to be devouring. Because the Bible makes us grow. It makes us strong as milk. It strengthens and enables growth. Uh, Psalm, under that, Psalm 119 again, 28. Uh, God's word brings strength to the soul. So let me, since uh, we keep on reading in Psalm 119, so let me read that one. It says, My soul melteth for heaviness, Strengthen thou me according to thy word. All right, so the next one. I'm trying to get through this. Uh, as honey, it is sweet and satisfying. All right, for time we won't. Uh, that's Psalm 19. That's another great passage on the word of God. Psalm 19, it starts in verse 7. Then as a hammer... As a hammer, it breaks our heart when it becomes hard. And most of us, if, if you've been saved for an, uh, any length of time, this world hardens our hearts. But the Word of God can break through that. So, as a hammer, it breaks our heart when it becomes hard. Uh, Twenty-three, twenty-nine. Is not my word like a, as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Then, it's also as fire, it warms our heart. In Luke 23, actually, I'm wanting to say that's Luke 24. We might have written down the wrong, let me check it. No, no, uh, uh, yeah, it is 24, sorry. 2432, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened us, uh, opened up the scripture. So this was on the road to Emmaus, so that's uh, 24. Sorry about that. As a fire, it warms our heart. So that gives us an understanding of why we need scripture. All of these are pictures of the word of God. It cleanses, uh, it's, so it's water, it's a seed, it's a fire, it's a lamp, uh, it's, uh, it's a hammer. All of these pictures help us to understand what the Word of God can do in my life. So then, what should I do with Scripture? What should I do? Since the Bible is God's Word, here's a few ideas. We give you six ideas of what to do. One, read them. Colossians 3 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's Colossians 3.16. What must dwell in our hearts? The word of Christ. So read them. The next one, listen to them. And that come listening to them means, I'm not saying get uh, audio, you know, audio book. What, by that I mean hear preaching. All right, Titus 1.3, one uh, uh, God makes his word known by preaching. God makes his word known by preaching. All right, and then the third one, study them. In Acts 17, the people search the scriptures daily, it says in Acts 17. And that's the passage, that's the church of Antioch. And they were known. Guess what? It doesn't, in the, in the book of Acts, yes, there's a lot of good passages and uh, we get a lot of instruction about the, basically the establishment of the church. But it wasn't until Acts 17, the church of Antioch, that because they searched the scriptures daily, that they were first known as Christians there. Because they were in that book. And they were in the book studying the book. So we read them, listen to them, study them. We memorize them. We should hide God's word in our hearts. Hide God's word in our hearts. So we memorize them. The third, uh, the, sorry, the fifth, obey them. When you obey God's word, guess what will happen? You'll be happy. Disobedient brings guilt, misery, and judgment. There are some people, 
Uh, my wife and I were talking about this on Friday and then yesterday. Uh, we were talking in the morning about this because some people, you know, they're like, you know what, uh, I, don't, I, I just don't like uh, the guilt. You know, and, and they talk about certain religions uh, that have a lot of guilt. Well, in Christianity, there is guilt. You know when there's guilt? When I sin. But I'm sorry, there should be guilt. Right. Some people think guilt is bad. Like, it, oh, man. Well, but guilt actually is a good thing because when I get to Scripture and there's guilt there, I want it gone. But the way it's gone is by going to Scriptures and following properly the scriptures so i read them i listen to them i study them i memorize them i obey them and then i proclaim them i proclaim them who should we tell about god's good news we tell others that's mark 6 16 15 that's the uh some people don't like the term the great commission all right but i i i think that it's there it's an instruction to uh churches and individuals to go out and what are we supposed to preach the gospel? It's proclaiming the words of God. So I go back to this and say the word of God is vital for us. The scriptures are so important. And uh, if, if there's anything that I can leave with you, and that is to have a love for the word of God. Get into the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Uh, read the Word of God. The Word of God has an amazing power. And that's why the devil attacks the Bible. That's why. I mean, if I, in, in the last 100 years, as far as in America, I mean, it has been attacked and been attacked and been attacked. Why? Because the Bible has transforming power. Uh, many years ago, there's a story of a, a, a well-known hymn. But many years ago, the author of that hymn was a teenager, and he left home to attend college, and his mother gave him a Bible. She worried about him going off to college, so he gave him a Bible, printed a verse of Scripture on the flyleaf of that Bible. The young man went off to college and soon discovered during his college life that he didn't really want much to do with the Bible, and so he forsook kind of the, the life that, would align itself with the Bible, and he lived that college party life. He spent all his money he could, he could acquire on fleeting pleasure. On one occasion, he needed money for whiskey, and he pawned that Bible that his mother had given him so he could get just uh, a little bit of money for whiskey. He made it through college. He became a doctor at a large hospital and was very successful. His name was Dr. Mackey. Mackey. Dr. Mackey treated a, a dying patient one time, and uh, the patient knew that he was dying, and so the patient looked at Dr. Mackey and said, could you have somebody get the book? He had no idea what the book was. So after the man passed away, Dr. Mackey noticed the man's book among his effects. He couldn't believe his eyes, because there, sitting in front of him, was the Bible that his mother had given him many years ago. And this dying man who he was treating said, I've got to have that book. He retreated to his office and he grabbed that book and he started reading it. He read it for hours and hours. And finally it brought him to his knees and he found Christ. Dr. Mackey later became a minister and we know a song he wrote Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May his soul be rekindled with fire from above. Revive us again. You know what he found? That book that his mother loved so much has an amazing power. 